beloved one i hope you are doing well i want us to take a short reading from the book of psalms chapter 127 it says if god's grace doesn't help the builders they will labor in vain to build a house if god's mercy doesn't protect the city all the centuries will circle it in vain it's really a senseless to work so hard from morning till late at night toiling to make a living for fear of not having enough now god can provide i want you to see this it says god can provide for his devoted lovers even while they sleep now this tells us of the great things that we enjoy anytime we come into God's presence. It tells us of the blessings we enjoy anytime we are with God. And then we can do this through prayer, through the word of God, and even as we are about listening to this. So I want us to do something. We are going to like this video. So then please hit on the like button if you have not done so. This helps YouTube recommend this video out there to anyone so everyone can have access to it also by doing this you help in the spread of the gospel and of the good work of this channel then don't forget to leave a comment in that comment section hit on that subscribe button if you haven't done so and you are new here and then get on to the notification bell and do us the favor of tapping on it too you were blessed So many questions. Thank you, Apostle, for being a blessing. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. So, um, let's see some questions. Okay. I think I've seen two of these, so let me just start with that. Okay. Two people asking the same question. You said um, to Apostle Selma, God's advancement program is threefold. World evangelism, equipping and maturing the saints that you did not give us number three. So, the second person say, Apostle, the third aspect of God's kingdom advancement program was skipped. So that means they are following. So what's number three? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. My apologies. Um, the first, like I said, is world evangelization. Second is the maturing of the saints. The third is societal transformation. Okay. Please write. The third is societal transformation, where the transformed individual who now together with the body of Christ is now transformed can now change and transform society. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next one here says, Apostle Joshua, when you have diverse of purpose. Ah, okay. I'll do, okay. How do you go about it, sir? I don't know. Well, maybe diverse of purpose. I, <laughs> I think I understand what the person is trying to say. Um, it is, well, it depends on your idea of purpose because purpose should not be confused with talents. Talents are the instruments that help you and giftings to fulfill purpose. When you enter a house, there is always a master door. There may be other doors in the house, but you access through a master door. So the most important thing, I define purpose as the role that you have to play in the big picture of God's program, right? So um, you must, this is why mentorship is very powerful because it helps you to be able to weave your ambition, your creativity and everything into a single assignment. I was, I was sitting there and watching beautifully as you were showing the different arms of expression in this ministry. Now, the ministry has a central theme. Is that true? That, that, that summarizes all that God has mandated Dr. Lumide to achieve. But you see that there were very many arms of expression um, captured in all the programs that you hold. So for that person, I will advise, number one, that you seek guidance to enlighten you so that we bring together all your area of giftings um, and then you must be able to use them to serve a very particular point. I'm sure you were taught about the seven mountains and, and you're familiar with them. The seven mountains represent the spheres of influence that controls the mind uh, and, and controls activities in our world. And so what you call your assignment is simply the role you have to play 
in one or more of these seven mountains. Um, for further study, let me refer you to a number of books that your man of God may have written as touching purpose. Are we together? Or you go to the bookstore and get Dr. Miles Monroe's book, God's Big Idea. That will help you to unlock uh, the subject of purpose. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to try and focus more on the questions they are asking you. I'll, I'll probably take my own tomorrow if there's, um, so that we can take yours. So this one says, okay, this is mine. Okay. If someone, if someone always sees himself sitting under a particular man of God's teaching, conference, and the man of God also praying for him in a dream, and the same persons do see himself in a dream casting out demons, and yet is not experiencing this in the physical. What could this signify? <laughs> <laughs> you are the interpreter of dream now. <laughs> A very sincere question. Well, it's not unusual to see. Now, remember that God, his, his, his method has always been men as far as reaching people. So it's not unusual to have dreams and visionary encounters where you see maybe a man of God you respect and honor, praying for you, ministering to you. God is simply revealing to you that there is a dimension of himself that he committed to that man of God that may be necessary for your overall profiting. It doesn't necessarily mean to leave your church and go to that man of God, not necessarily. You see, because that would produce a lot of rebellion, it's important to be planted where God has kept you. However, um, with proper pastoral guidance and counsel, you can explore, God can help you to explore the particular materials from that man of God that may add up for your profiting. It's like a student who is studying in the university. There are courses that are called electives. Is that true? And sometimes you may need to go to another faculty entirely to outsource one or two courses, but that does not deviate you from what you are studying. Are we together? So that you are having dreams, praying for someone, and um, waking up and it not happening, uh, that is a natural thing. It is stimulating you to know that that can be a realm of reality if you walk in keeping with certain conditions. Joseph had a dream. He saw himself exalted, but that was not the case. So he needed to go through all of the dealings that will ultimately lead him there. The good news is that at the end, he got there. So for whoever submitted that question, my charge for you would be to submit yourself to prayers, mentorship, the word, you know, fellowship, and you'll find out that you begin to grow and evolve to the person who can manifest the things that you've seen in your dream. I hope that helps. God okay. bless you. Um, how do I get healing on my eyes? For the more I pray, the more it gets worse. And I've been to a lot of hospitals and many people have prayed for me. What can be responsible for this delay in my healing? Thank you. The healing ministry generally depends on the hearing of faith. Every time the Bible talks about the healing ministry of Jesus, as we learn, it always goes hand in glove with hearing. So um, sometimes, as much as believers have access to God, for the reasons that I have taught here, you may not yet have, have access that level of grace and experience to administer that healing for yourself. And so, conferences like this give the Holy Spirit an allowance to use vessels he has anointed to also reach out to you on that wise. So for whoever that person is, come tonight with your heart open, expecting that the power of God will touch you. But know this for certainty, that the healing ministry is still valid and Jesus is still in the business of healing. Amen. God bless you. Uh, my question goes to Apostle Selman. How can I really surrender? We spoke about what does it really entail? Um, okay. Surrender broadly is, uh, um, has to do with what, number one, dying to self. That means you get to a point where Jesus Christ and his purposes become your highest obsession, your highest priority. And nobody can truly surrender by himself. You just give God the chance and the allowance to dethrone every other thing that is not God in your life. Are we together now? So surrender is a cumulative of many phases and many processes of dealings with God where you become 
alive to righteousness and dead to yourself, the impulses of this world, materialism, and all the things that seem to distract the believer. So it's not just a one-off thing that happens. Um, surrender is an ongoing process. Paul says it this way. He says that I die daily. So that is the process of surrender. But the, ultimately, the goal of surrender is to get you to that point where Christ and his purposes are enthroned at the epicenter of your heart. That does not mean you will not focus on any other thing, but that when it has to do with Christ and his purposes, nothing else is exalted above it. So that is God's idea of surrender. Hallelujah. Okay, there are many questions around this same theme, but I think it's been, if you listen to the message, many times you need to understand that um, you need to listen to a message over and yes. over again until the word becomes flesh. Because most of the time, the questions you are asking are things that has already been dealt with. Uh, so many of them are around, um, I'm always weak in the spirit. How do I stay strong in the spirit? How do I maintain power for my spiritual growth? There, these are the things that have been taught. So, but generally, the theme is around how do I keep that fire going oh, as a believer? Okay, so yeah. that, that's a very good question. I think most believers do not know how to sustain their spiritual fire. Spiritual growth and spiritual maturity have a very definite pathway that leads there. Number one is the ministry of the word. Two scriptures I will give you. You may want to write them down. Number one, um, Acts chapter 2 from verse 42 to 47, where we read earlier that they, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in breaking of bread, fellowship, and prayer. And then the second is Acts chapter 6 and verse 4. It says, but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So essentially, believers grow and mature uh, to the extent to which they encounter the word of God and they submit themselves to the ministry of prayer. But then corporate fellowship like this where believers can be mentored is a very a powerful platform to be able to grow the believer. You must, um, well, um, let, me, let me ask for permission, and if your pastor allows, let me please recommend a teaching for you that you want to listen, Equipping the Saints. Equipping the Saints. You can find that on YouTube at the permission of your pastor. I say that because I teach there on the training pathway of the believer. For instance, I say how that your prayer life is not going to be rich until it is systematized. Randomly praying does not lead you to progress. You have to create a system around your prayer life. And then your encounter with the word. There are three things we do with the word in order to be matured by it. Number one, we study the word. Number two, we hear the word because faith comes by hearing. And then number three, we speak the word. So when it has to do with the ministry of the word, we study, your mind is involved, your hearing is involved, your speaking is involved. And then, of course, corporate fellowship. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. For, for the person seeking maturity, do not downplay prayer, do not downplay the study of the word. Uh, the word there extends to materials. I saw that there's a book stand, and if I'm right, I see that there's a book stand there too. So do well to access the relevant materials. And let me recommend for you, if you are starting, the best way I recommend for a believer who is starting is topical study of the scripture. Topical study. That means you pick topic by topic if it's on faith, if it's on righteousness, uh, you may not yet have the stamina to start reading 15 chapters a day or explore from a theological standpoint. So it's wise and simple. This is where devotionals also help because they give a topical approach to the study of scripture. I hope that helps. God bless you. Okay. Um, this person seemed to want to know more about you. This is, these are personal questions, but um, they will help people. Number one, who is your spiritual father? Then the second person is also asking, God has been using you mightily and we know you are not married. So how do you deal with temptation of women to be able to stand as a man of God? Okay, praise the Lord. Uh, well, no, no, let's, let's be fair and honest to whoever that person is. 
the temptation, let me start with the second. The temptation over women and the rest has nothing to do with being married or not. It's only a lot more aggressive when you're not. The same disciplines hold true for anybody. Mm -hmm. when, because when it has to do with the matters of the flesh, it has no respect whether you have a wife, whether you have children, whether you are young or old. You see, that is the truth. Uh, I think the key, the key, aside from your personal conviction, dying to self, the key is to create systems around your life. Um, when you do not create systems around your life, inevitably, married or not, you will fall victim. So number one, it starts with your fellowship. Every anointing has a consecration level that protects and preserves it. Hallelujah. And then secondly, it's important to create. This is why periodic retreats are very important because they give you an opportunity to go before the Lord and to cry out to be dealt with and to be built by God. Are we together now? And that is very, very important. Now to the first question. It's created a lot of controversy, unfortunately, in the body of Christ. Uh, well, if you are dealing with the issue of fatherhood and submission, um, most people ask these questions because they come from Pentecostal circles. When you meet people who come from Orthodox background, especially people who come from the North, this question uh, has an angle to it. The concept of mentorship and fatherhood to people who were raised by the North is rather systemic than individual. Because the way ministries are in the North, they do not have a single overseer that everybody who comes under submits to. Now, that does not mean it is wrong. Are we together now? I've heard all kinds of teachings about that. And um, we came from a background where whoever was your pastor, after three years, you will not see the person again. You get the point now. At various phases of my life and my experience, I've had different people being introduced. I was raised from Equa. My grandfather, by the way, was the founding father and the trustee of the Church of Christ in Nation. So I came from that, that lineage, and then my experience with the evangelical church winning all, and then seasons of mentorship and training under Archbishop Benjamin Kwashi, the Anglican Seminary. You see that? But then I think the unique nature of my life mandated and necessitated that I kept having a lot of experiences with different people, uh, I would, I would not frown at the concept of having a single father, an individual who you lead. I submit to the body of Christ. I'm very clear about that. You've seen my relationship with fathers. Um, and I've gone to the Lord in prayer, uh, asking questions on that. And God has planted me across several people, a father in the Lord, uh, Baba Deboye, Bishop Oedipo, and several people. These are people who represent authority structure. So my concept of fatherhood uh, is a bit different from what is generally understood in the body of Christ. And I don't want to delve so much so that it does not become a template that brings confusion nor plant rebellion to people who are submitting to fathers. That's why I'm careful addressing this. But the concept of fatherhood as we know in church uh, it's not all that there is to fatherhood, unfortunately. For various reasons, um, I may not want to delve into certain things here because I, this is not exclusively a pastor's conference, else there are things we would have been able to share. But here is my, my, um, my take for whoever is asking that question. If God has planted you in a ministry like this, the man of God, the overseer that he has set over you, becomes your father from the word Abba, the one who begat you in the gospel. That is the original idea of fatherhood. The one who begat you in the gospel. But you see that that template is not really ideal because many people who come are usually already saved and even already transformed. For most of them, there may be men and women who are in ministry who just come to submit to get direction. So what most people call fatherhood is actually mentorship. Fatherhood classically starts from the point of getting you saved and then growing you spiritually. That means there is a track record of having, making, have, having made that spiritual investment in your life. You get the idea now? So there, there are dimensions of fatherhood, unfortunately, that have been abused in Africa. For many people, it's just a license to show that you are not a rebel. 
And so people just look for anybody and just continue with a lot of rebellion with no touch at all with the father. The purpose of fatherhood is supposed to be for guidance, for mentorship, for correction. There are other people who have even deviated from the way of the Lord because of honor to fatherhood. Um, this is why I don't want to get into certain details because you will find out that when fatherhood is not correct, you can literally lose the context of your call. If the father is insecure as a person, he will have to force you to be loyal to the template he has given you, which may be against what God told you, which is the security that Eli had to allow Samuel to evolve. If he had followed the Eli pattern, something would go wrong. So uh, fatherhood issue is very, very complicated, but I will leave you with this word. The man you see is not a rebel. This man you see, I am more submissive than most people that you see. There are results you cannot attain unto except when certain spiritual laws are in place. Are we together? So I hope I was able to help whoever that person is. Okay. So I think um, maybe this will also help with the issue you have just mentioned. Yes. Now. Many thanks for your powerful and insightful teaching you taught during your session. I could recall... Uh, now, this question is for both of us, okay. but I want to give it to you because of what you have just said now. Then I will also answer my part later because I want okay. us to focus more on you. So the person in the first paragraph is referring to my session. Um, I could recall that you said in your session that it is a joy for every spiritual father to see his or her sons thriving and succeeding more yes. than them, mm. which is what I said in my session. So the person now went to this question that now affects two of us. Now, I would like to get clarity from both of you. So, he has now oh. left me to talk. <laughs> so, having served my spiritual father closely for 16 years, faithfully and sincerely, with all I have got, a time came that God now beckoned at me to go and start my ministry and with a lot of confirmations, vetting the authenticity of this timely message of living. My spiritual father is not willing to let me go and has been using every means, crooked and unbiblical, to tie me down. There has been a track record of people leaving the ministry out of anger and frustration. I do not want to be like those people. I want to wait until I'm released. So what do I do? Do I obey God or hearken to the spiritual father? Hmm. Praise the Lord. This, this is a very, please listen, let's listen. This is a very sincere person. Now, um, you, you don't say driving is bad because there are so many accidents on the road. So, my attempt to answer this question is by no means downplaying the role of fatherhood. But I want to submit to you, and I've had the honor of discussing this uh, privately with some of our fathers of faith in this nation. I have expressed my personal concern as to what we call fatherhood in Africa. I submit to you that um, a lot of what we call fatherhood in Africa is not scriptural fatherhood. It's just a lot of eventing of insecurities from people. Now because, um, and please take note of my disclaimer, don't go around insulting fathers. I have frowned at that and discouraged it at the highest level, but just to honor this question truthfully. So many people so many people have missed out on their purpose and their assignment because of the idea of fatherhood. The idea of fatherhood in Africa is almost slavery. It's as though you are connected to someone and your life and relevance only holds provided you are with the person. There is no sense if you are ever found walking in any pattern that God told you that is outside of the frame of understanding of the father, you are going to get into trouble. And then the father's battle also becomes your battle if there are friends and, you know, all kinds of things. I don't want to go into that. But for this person, um, I will not encourage rebellion at any level. I rather will encourage you to seek counsel from somebody who is a contemporary at the level of your father. Don't seek counsel from someone who is your contemporary. They will not be able to help because the Bible says to not rebuke an elder. 
in public are we together so if i were that person the first thing i'm going to do is to continue to pray as i serve that to the last second in that ministry you leave a track record of loyalty and faithfulness because you are sowing a seed the ministry you are about to start you will also have sons and one day they will also go you see so i will encourage that person number one you have served for 16 years remember that happened between jacob and laban when he served, he wanted to go. Laban said, you are not going anywhere. Switch wives for him. The guy added, uh, you know, time again and so on and so forth. Because he learned that it was through him that God was prospering him. Now, let me submit to you. Um, when you are a true father, it's very painful having invested in people. It's a human thing that when you have invested in people and sometimes they are living uh, like any parent who want to do, sometimes you just want to retain them and keep them. This is why we teach in pastors' conferences that you should never have only one person doing the greatest task in a ministry. Always reproduce yourself. Once you have only one person who seems to be the pillar, you are pushing them to the corridors of pride and compromise. There is nothing that cannot be reproduced. You see, so that if and when God calls those people genuinely to go, they would have done well to have worthy replacements. Usually the pain happens when the individual is going to leave a very big vacuum and it will affect the ministry. So I always encourage people to develop people. Don't give people an idea in the ministry that only one or two people are exceptional to get certain things done because it's not true. Everybody who is trained and is shown the pathway can attain to a commendable level of value. Uh, for this person, I will advise that you seek counsel, look for an elderly person in the faith or someone who is within the level of the contemporary of, of, uh, of your man of God, a contemporary person, and meet the person in honor and respect. Don't go around tearing down your pastor, your father. No, whether he's right or wrong, the judgment is unto God. Don't go around saying, this man is doing this, he's using whatever it is. And then if for any reason you are counseled to leave, at the, very, uh, at the worst case scenario, leave in peace. That means don't tear down people and say, are you not following me? Are you blind over what is happening here? That is not your concern. If you must leave, you find out you are convicted. If you are married and you discuss with your wife, you discuss with the systems of authority around your life and they give you the go ahead, you may politely live in peace. You see, in any case, do not cause trouble in that church or that assembly because you may seem to be happy for a while that you've gone, but I can assure you eventually it will backfire. There is no license for rebellion whatsoever. Fathers are not perfect. They are humans. They make mistakes. And that is the reason why everybody must all together continue to grow and learn. But if as a son, one who has served there, if you observe any flaws there, your first responsibility to your father is to intercede sincerely. The sons of Noah saw their father's nakedness. And one went to call the rest to come and laugh at him. Noah was drunk, but when he woke up, he was still prophetic to know the person who rebelled against him. And it cost him. And the other one said, no, 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 no. Even though it's our father's nakedness, he walked behind and he came and covered him. It's not endorsing licentiousness. Fathers are humans. They make all kinds of mistakes. We owe them our prayer. We owe them our support. Not to laugh at their mistakes and all that they do. But if and when living in that circle is causing you to sin, causing you to deviate from the pathway, the known pathway of God, then it may be a wise thing to live. In any case, live in peace. Don't cause trouble. Hallelujah. Okay. Um, this one is zeroed in on music ministers as a case study, but the focus, because it's very long, the focus is that we're talking about people submitting their soul to the devil yes. and all the stuff. Um, because I always, I've, I've thought that you're either in the secret cult or, or you're in the secret place. place. There's no true. middle ground. And we, we still mentioned yesterday, um, when he took Jesus to the top of the mountain, he said, which you also said, I think yesterday this morning, he said, bow down, worship him, and I, I showed him the kingdoms, plural, which are all the spheres, mm -hmm. and their glory. And he said, if you bow down, I will give it to you. Yes. And there's a connection between worship and wealth, which are things I've thought. So now, the person is saying that we see a lot of people that seem to have submitted their soul to the devil. And they are doing well. But the, we don't see the consequence on earth. 
for many of them. So the person is now giving an example that all the music ministers, that a lot of gospel ministers, they are transformed, they are empowered, but they are not blowing. And that we have, that if you look at nine major, let's say out of ten people that are musicians, nine will be unbelievers. There are only few gospel ministers have been able to blow. But all these people, we know they are serving devil, but they are still blowing. And there's no judgment. We can't see any judgment. So, Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Uh, praise God. It's a very honest question also. Um, there, 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 are two, there are two ways of dealing with this. Number one, we have to redefine your concept of blowing. Um, that is the first thing we have to look at because when you become a spiritual man, the parameters for measuring success change. Influence, uh, influence in the kingdom is not just from a secular standpoint alone. So we have to vet what you know and what you propose to be blowing. Uh, so that's the first thing we look at. But in any case, um, let me submit to you that the Bible says friendship with the world is enmity with God. So when you, are, when you are an advocate of the kingdom directly, vocally, especially in the music ministry, um, you would still have to refer to my message on power because the, the system, don't forget that we are contending against an antichrist system that has vowed to not allow righteousness and godliness strive. There are television stations around the world that does not allow you to mention the name Jesus. There are television stations that don't allow you to do some of the things that you're doing, uh, that you're doing for the kingdom. In many regions, they will shut it down immediately. Um, some of these secular musicians have a lot of sponsorships, a lot of aids, a lot of leverage that, that they thrive upon. Um, and then rising by righteousness in a crooked world is very difficult. Are we together? Haven't mentioned that, let me also tell you that success has universal laws. I must be very honest with you. So just because you are a gospel minister or you are a preacher, if you do not walk in keeping with the laws that have been made in the kingdom for rising and excelling, you will fail. And the reason will not be because you are serving Jesus. So while we have, there is a place where the devil's attacks and all of that antagonism against the gospel is there. But I think there are people on earth who have been able to move with the dignity of kingdom integrity and rise to commendable levels. I'm saying this because there are many believers who do not practice the principles that make for global influence and then they use the excuse of the devil and blame everything. Um, I have studied the subject of influence and I pray that God will use my own life to prove that you can rise and do whatever it is that you do in Kenya last year. You know, we had a program there and it was an incredible thing. 65,000 people and all that organization happened within a month or so. It, so kingdom influence can happen. And of course, we're all witnesses what God did in the United Kingdom just last week. Uh, and, and it brought great glory to the name of the Lord. So I do not, yes, I do not think that it is an excuse to say that just because you are a Christian, you do not rise. You do not have to compromise. What you need to do is submit to the mentorship sessions that the man of God is teaching. Uh, I submit to you that some of the truths he's communicating to you, if you receive them and believe them, they sustain the ability to grant you influence at a global level. I made up my mind as a man of God that I'll not raise people who are only spiritual, but that I will raise people who are also a people of influence because kingdom advancement happens through evangelism and influence, not evangelism alone, you see. So for the gospel um, musicians, it may be a bit difficult, especially when you are starting because in Africa, there are no systems of leverage that easily lift you. You have to prove yourself until you have attained a certain level. This is where the Holy Spirit comes. And this is where understanding things like the law of honor, relationships, and the rest come in. So I tell people, in addition to your value, make sure that you build strategic relationships that can be a leverage for you. In Nigeria, for instance, most gospel ministers rise to the degree to which they are connected to a local assembly. 
So the leverage that comes from the man of God, the visibility that they receive, you will seldom find people who are not truly connected to a church just rising at a national or at least at a continental level because most of the invites that give you visibility and the conferences where you'll be invited will usually be from the leverage of church. So it's important for whoever it is that is seeking to rise as a gospel minister to study both the spirituality of music and the industry of music. Hallelujah. I hope I was able to attempt your question. Okay, so I think um, we'll wrap up with these two questions. One of it, I have to take it for the purpose of the fact that I know some people have also asked that question before. Yes. And then this will be the fun. And, and it's about um, people that want to be a blessing to you. A lot of people, they want to bless you. So I have to ask just for integrity purpose that a lot of people are ask that question, how can we, because sometimes you don't know why, you know, I want to see a person, I want to so sit down, I'm like, look, we can, we go to Abuja, it's in Abuja, you can't be coming, so, but I just have to ask, maybe you can help give clarity to that, because sometimes when you go to preach in a place, we get phone calls, and when is he coming, I can't, I want to say, I say, look, we can't, we are not in charge of his program, we cannot make, because you say you want to so sit then you come, it's, you start wasting time, so, people that want to be a blessing to you personally, how do they go about that? Well, I submit to you that it's an uncomfortable question. Uh, because of how men and women of God bastardize this issue of um, uh, compromises and lack of integrity, it's made me so uncomfortable. In fact, God had to warn me about, I give a lot of seeds, especially to our fathers, and they receive it, but receiving from others, God had to tell me, other people received my own seed for me to rise. So I must be fair enough to receive seeds from people. Um, generally, um, when, when I come to a, ethically, when I come to a ministry like this, I always want to walk in keeping with the modus operandi within the church. Uh, it, is, it, is, it is a personal creed that I live up to. You don't find me come to a church and I'm talking with some people and collecting seeds. I just believe it's not ethical enough. It is my respect and my regard to the ministry that is hosting me. So usually... If and when the man of God allows me to see the people and they are bringing seats and is aware and they are fine with it, we can speak the blessing on them and receive it. Else, if they have a system where they collate the seats together and send it, that is fine. But these are the channels. Uh, things like my account number and the rest, uh, I frown at it so much. My friend and brother, Pastor Nath, Nathaniel Bassi, it took him a long time to get my account number and then when he displayed it in Hallelujah Challenge, I wanted to sink into the ground. I said, no, 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 no. <laughs> said, it's just my thing. But that does not mean that, um, that giving is wrong. Let me encourage you, not just to me, but even to um, Dr. Lumide Emmanuel. It is very scriptural, especially at programs like this, to give. I assure you that if you do not give, there are certain levels you will not rise to. Um, you can be hardworking, you can be diligent, but giving is the kingdom's way by which the saints rise. So if you are considering in your heart to sow seeds, I can tell you it's not the devil leading you. Um, that's number one. But number two, we have to submit to whatever modus operandi is available. So I would leave that to um, Dr. Lumide Emmanuel. He can be able to guide on however you see fit to communicate. The most important thing is that it is done decently. It is done consciously with understanding, not by manipulation, and that it is done with the highest level of integrity. Praise God. Okay, so, so to help you put that in context, if you have a specific seed that you want to sow into his life, you write a check or you put the money in an envelope, and then you put his name on the envelope and your own name and your phone number on the envelope. So we'll give it to him. You don't have to see him. He will pray for you. You don't need to see him for the prayer to work. Do you understand? So don't think that we'll now form a queue. All of you will now be waiting for No, no, no. You'll now be putting 200 naira. You want to see no, no, no. There's no... So put the seed in an envelope. Write his name. Write your name and your number. Uh -huh. And then you put it there, and then we'll get it to him. God bless you. Finally, because of time, we have three minutes more. Um, good morning, Apostle. Please, what will you advise someone who has a call on his or her life, but is finding it difficult to leave his or her business totally? Not because of himself, but because there are so many people depending on him financially. So, should the individual leave everything and go into full-time ministry? 
Because so it's like somebody that is okay. Look, it's not even about me now. I want to obey, but everybody, my father, mother, but everybody is like me. They are doing, so should I shut it down, go into full time ministry, or what do I do? That's the final question. That okay, that, that's a very honest question. Uh, the 21st century is redefining our idea of full time ministry. Mm -hmm. I define full time ministry as full time commitment, mm -hmm. not just that you are only preaching, except when God gives you a direct instruction that is verified by the authorities around your life and they agree with you that we are witnesses that this was a unique call. I'm saying that because living in the 21st century, many people run away from marrying preachers today, run away from ministers because they have, they have, um, they have assumed a template that has made God look like an irresponsible person. There are people who have left good jobs, they've left a lot of things. Now, in truth, ministry will occupy you, it will take from your time. But I doubt that ministry at its infancy will occupy you so much that you will need to leave your job. That is the truth. Depends on what you are doing. As much as possible, I advise people until your job becomes a provable distraction. It may not be wise to just leave your job like that, especially when you are married with children. Because the woman did not marry a man of God. She married a husband. And the Bible mandates that you be a responsible man at any level. Mm -hmm. I say this because there are many ministers who, who because of their, not, their inability to provide for their families, they find themselves at the corridors of compromise. This is what leads to some of this manipulation because when your wife is crying, your children are crying, and you have the gift of prophecy. Mm. <laughs> you, 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 you see, you, you see that most likely um, you are going to use it for a very wrong reason. Uh, you see, and, and you don't want to do ministry that way. So my counsel for such a person is that you can use your workplace to test whether you even succeed in ministry. Mm. Because if you start from there, everybody in your workplace is a potential member of your church. So you mm. test. If it does not work in your workplace, you may need to pipe down a bit. <laughs> and then maybe I would say this finally. There is a difference between being called and being sent. For many people, be, you are called unto Jesus. You are sent from Jesus to the nations. So just because God has called you and you are now aware that the call of God is upon your life does not mean you have been sent. He called the disciples and the mission is follow me. When he now sends them, he sends them to the nations. So there are many people who the call of God is true upon their life, but the season of being sent has not come. And so they just release themselves and find out that the backing that should come is not there. You see that now. So it's very important. Jesus said, when I sent you, lackest thou anything? Because if you stay on your call, you will be taught how to prosper when you are sent. Are we together now? So to whoever that person is, and if you are a man of God and you, are, you know that you are not going to be doing a secular job, attend the trainings so that you have a good business. When Peter followed Jesus, he didn't close down fishing. Fishing was still on. Remember when it backfired, he said, I go a fishing. And the other disciples said, we go with you. <laughs> and notice, when Jesus met them, he called them by prospering what they were currently doing. In John 21, he now made them to have a large cash. Then he said, now come to me. Mm -hmm. Because he knew that if, if they did not find a sense of fulfillment, they would not come again. Mm -hmm. So he did something about the fishing and then he now came and said, lovest thou me more than this. You see that Paul was a tent maker. I can tell you sincerely, if you do not create systems and structures that sort your finance, it does not have to be a job. But you must channel um, streams of income that are able to help you at the infancy of ministry um, you may not have impacted people enough to reward you to an extent that you can have money to invest or do some other things so it's always wise to have a business or have a job or at least set up a system that you can supervise while you serve the Lord as God increases you and as you are dispensing that spiritual value if people keep giving to you whether honorariums or blessings like this God gives you the wisdom and listening to your pastor now helps you to know what to do with the monies that is now coming.
Because for many people, if you don't have financial intelligence, even if a billion naira is given to you, you will still struggle eventually. And you are a very blessed church to have a man of God who loves God and is so thoroughly financially intelligent to be able to guide you to know what to do. I, I, and I tell you, I've read School of Money, I don't know how many times, and I know the wisdom that I have gleaned from that. So uh, for that preacher, I recommend every preacher who is here and has not bought School of Money, go to my right, there is an, the, the, there's the, the book there, go and get it and add it to all the revival materials you have because you will need it. <laughs> Praise the Lord. God bless you. Hallelujah. Well, since he has mentioned that, you know, on Saturday I'll be 53 years old. So, I'm a young man. I started early. Last year I celebrated 33 years in ministry. I started as a teenager. So, we are doing 53% discounts wow. on all my products. Wow. So, if you go and get it now, it will actually be cheaper for you. And the discount expires on Sunday. By that you call on Monday. Uh -huh. Everything, even land, 53% discount. The only thing that doesn't have discount is house. There's no discount on the house, so I won't sell house because the profit of the house is not a hair. But if you want to buy like anything you are buying, our lands, every estate, 53% discount, birthday offer expires on Sunday. Okay, let me say this, please. Okay. Just to honor Dr. Lumide Emmanuel's birthday, let me surprise him. The first 20 ministers that go to the bookstand, not now, respect, please don't. The first 20 ministers that go to the bookstand, please, they have the school of money free of charge. That, 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 is, that is the support to honor his investment and his contribution but you have to be a minister. You have to be a minister of the gospel. This is not, I know that everybody wants to pick. Some of you will not read it. You are a minister of the gospel, serving in the vineyard. Let me lend my faith with him and, and my support to honor him these 53 years and to support this phenomenal work that he's brought to our world. Thank you so much, sir. So, um, just to finalize that, I always say, you don't go into full time until your hands are full. So most of the time, you will end up stealing or lying or suffering. When you have 12 members and you say you are doing full-time, sometimes it's just laziness. So let's make sure that, because full-time does not mean that you should abandon everything. Full-time ministry means that ministry should be your primary assignment, but not your only assignment. So let's learn to put balance in this thing so that God will help us. Let's appreciate Apostle. Thank you. Dearly beloved, I hope you were blessed by this message. Do not keep the video to yourself. Share to as many as you can to help them bless. Check our homepage for more of our messages. Subscribe to the channel. Comment on it. Like it. See you on our next video. Bye. Pray. Pray. Pray for your destiny. Salaskate Bashkana Kata Branda Katekatos Kate Branda Katapa Kotos Koto Brekateka Nekata The phase of development Lord grant me the discipline